You know, in the Bible, there are two that are presented in pairs. And they are presented in pairs because they synergize each other. Like I said earlier, you know, Jesus is full of grace and full of truth. The grace allows us to be embraced by the Lord regardless of our condition. The truth, once we are secure there, cleanses us of all unrighteousness. Like Christ crucified is the power of God and the wisdom of God. The power of God to set us free from Satan. The wisdom of God to make us more like Jesus. The devil cannot change scripture but he can add a spin to the scripture so that we reach the wrong conclusion. Remember how he tried that with Jesus? He said, it is written that if you jump from here, angels will pick you up. I mean, he was quoting the scripture, but the interpretation he was suggesting was the wrong one. The area where the devil banks more heavily than any other area is the area of the two great commandments. To love God with all our soul and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And what the devil has done has led us in the direction of valuing more our love for God than our love for our fellow men. Even as I say this, I can see it on your face that you say, well, Ed, are you sure that's the way it is? Yes. Because remember when the young ruler came to Jesus in Luke chapter 10, he said, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, well, what, what do you read? Well, I read that I must love God with everything I have, and I must love my neighbor as well. Which one of the two did Jesus question? Not the love for God, but the love for the neighbor. He said, you need those two to come together. For us to reach a city for Christ, for us to be willing to die, is that what it takes to reach a city, to reach a neighborhood, to bring our unsaved loved ones to Christ? We must believe that loving the lost is as important as loving God. Now, there is a sequential order, you know, like first come our love for God. Why? Because we love him back with the same love that he loved us. But it's not a yo-yo. He loves me, I love him, he loves me, I love him. But he loves me, I love him, and now I love my fellow men. So that when we reach that level, now we have reached the highest level. If the devil can do anything to stop you from loving God, he will do it. But he usually fails because God is so lovable. You know, he's so full of mercy that we cannot help but love him. So what he does, he goes for second best. You will love God, but don't love your neighbor because they are a bunch of perverts, they are terrible people, blah, blah, blah. And if he can nick one of the two commands, he will affect the other command as well. That's why in John chapter 21, when Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? And remember, that's the first time that God is in a position to be loved by a man or by a human being because prior to Calvary, God loved the world, but the world couldn't love him back because of sin. But now sin has been atoned for, so that now God can receive love back. It's like the first time your baby called you dada, mama. I mean, you don't forget that. I mean, you have been loving that thing for so long, and now he or she is loving you back. Well, now God, uh, now Jesus asked Peter, son of Barjona, he gives him all the old nature credentials, do you love me? And I believe, as I said earlier, that at that moment, heaven stood still. And God the Father and the angels and the Holy Spirit were saying, for the first time, we're going to hear it. For the first time, Peter, do you love me? Yes, I do. What did Jesus say next? Love me more? No. He said what? Feed my sheep. 
feed my sheep. And we have interpreted that to mean that God told Peter, be the pastor of my church, which is true, but it's not the whole truth. He said, be the pastor of the church, yes, but above all, be the pastor of the flock. And the flock is made up of the saved and the unsaved. And one mistake that we make is to make the fold, where the saved ones are, equal to the flock. The fold is not the flock. The fold is part of the flock. But the flock is made up of those sheep that are in the fold, saved, and those that are outside of the fold. The good shepherd left the 99 alone and was out there looking for the lost. So that the implication is, if you love me, take care of those that need to be fed out there. And if you know anything about sheep, the ones that need feeding are not the ones in the fold, and the ones outside of the fold. So since those days, the devil has been busy trying to get Christians so fascinated with loving God in private that there will be no good loving the lost out there. So what I want to do today in this session is walk you through a contrast. It was like turning the lights on to understand this between Luke chapter 9 and Luke chapter 10. These two chapters are important because in Luke chapter 9, Jesus reached what could be the lowest point emotionally. He was ready, well, not ready, but he was tempted with quitting. In Luke 9, 41, he says, Oh, unbelieving and perverted generation, how much longer must I put up with you? You know who he said that to? To his disciples. You are perverted, you are unbelieving. I don't think I can put up with you any longer. I'm ready to go home. So that it was a very low point. In chapter 10, Verse, um, verse 22, it says, And at that very time Jesus rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit. And the word greatly means that he was overflowing with joy. So pause for a moment now. Do you see the contrast? Chapter 9, Jesus is so discouraged that he says, I wish I could be home with my father. Chapter 10, he's so overflowing with joy that he's praising God. What caused the sadness and what caused the joy? But what are the differences between these two chapters? Well, in one, Jesus is sad. In the other, he's overflowing. In one, he's dealing with the 12. In the other, he's dealing with the 70. In chapter 9, one demon is able to defeat nine of his disciples. Remember in chapter 9, verse 40, that demon that refused to come out? In chapter 10, Satan himself fell to the ground. So that chapter 9 is a dark chapter. Chapter 10 is a bright chapter. Chapter 9, Satan is scored. Chapter 10, Jesus is scored. Another difference is that a similar thing that has two different results is that in chapter 9, verses 1 on, in chapter 10, verse, verse 1 on, Jesus commissions the 12 to do certain things in the 70. But when the 12 come back in chapter 9, it says that they gave him a report of everything that they had done. So they gave a report that was centered on what they did. In chapter 10, the 70 gave a report that was centered on the joy that came to those that they ministered to as the demons came out. So here we have a tension. So walk with me. If you go one chapter earlier, chapter 8, verse 40, you will say that Jesus returned and the multitudes welcomed him. 
What was the attitude of the multitudes for Jesus? They welcomed him. The multitudes loved Jesus. Then he's being almost crushed by the multitudes in verse 42, but he can feel the touch of a woman that is in a technical violation of the law because having an issue of blood, she should be indoors. And she's outdoors touching a rabbi. And he calls her out. She's shaking because she knows that she's in a violation. And Jesus says, uh, be in peace, daughter. Your faith has made you well. So tremendous, tremendous rapport with the people. Then in chapter 9, he sends the 12 to go and do all kinds of healing. And in verse 6, they began going about among the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. In verses 7 through 9, tells us that Herod wanted to see Jesus. This is a very important point because the multitudes that welcomed Jesus were not safe people, but they wanted to see Jesus. Herod is the one that chopped off John the Baptist's head. He wanted to see Jesus. The point I'm bringing home is this. The lost want to see Jesus even though they don't know who Jesus is. There is something in the human heart that God already prepared that causes human beings to have a craving for a savior. Now, they don't know if his name is Allah or Muhammad or Buddha, but they are looking for a savior. And this is a very important point because when we don't believe that the lost are looking for a savior, we develop a confrontational approach to evangelism and we hit them, and we push them, and we abuse them in every way, trying to make them feel terrible for their sins. When in reality, everybody has a craving for God. Because if they didn't, then something is wrong. Why will God provide something that people don't need? So now the 12 come back, and they give a report of everything that they had done. You can see that in verse 10. So Jesus takes them on a spiritual retreat. I'm sure they were flying high like a kite. Lord, we get all of you for ourselves. We're going to have Jesus. We're going to have a spiritual retreat. Look what happens in verse 11. Mother-in-law shows up in the honeymoon suite uninvited. The multitudes found out where Jesus was, and they just showed up. Now, what is Jesus response when he's interrupted by sinners who barge in into a spiritual retreat. He began teaching and welcoming them, he began teaching them and healing them. And the verb here indicates that Jesus took his time because to them the loss were very important. Now look at verse 12. Now the 12 comes and say, Lord, we have a suggestion. Can you dismiss the multitude? Can you get rid of them? We are here to be with you, not with sinners. And Jesus doesn't like that. He says, I'll tell you what, you feed them. Lord, we don't have food. Get food. We don't have money. What do you have? Well, we have five loaves and two fish. And look what Jesus says. Tell them to sit down to eat in groups of 50. That was a very smart thing to do. Because the apostles didn't want anything to do with the multitude. I'm with Jesus. I don't want to be with lost people. So by telling them in group of 50, they have to go and say, okay, folks, 1, 2, 3, 48, 49, 50. Hold hands, stretch, sit down. 1, 2, Three steps for a nine. One, two, three, 49, 50. Otherwise, Peter would have said, attention, sit down. But Jesus wanted them to come in touch and touch them one by one, one by one. And once they were all comfortably reclined, he fed them. 
The tension that we see here, we see it in the church. If today the queer nation were to show up here, or 300 homosexuals were to show up in church, or 10 people with AIDS were to show up in church, just examine your feelings about that. We don't like multitudes. We like Jesus. So after he dismissed them, he asked the apostles, verse um, 18, who do the multitudes say that I am? And I'm sure tongue in cheek, they say, oh, Lord, they are so illiterate theologically. They think that you are John the Baptist or Elijah, one of the prophets. I mean, these guys are out to lunch. I'll tell you, some of the Christian radio commentators, we have had a series on the lack of orthodoxy on the part of the multitudes, you know, the belief that they entertain. So then Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And Peter says in verse 20, in verse 20 you are the Christ of God. Now listen carefully. That is the core of the core of the core of the gospel. Nothing is more pure and more, more pure and more true than Christ, the Christ of God. That should be preached from the mountain tops. But in verse 21, Jesus warned them, warned them, and instructed them not to say it to anyone. Why? Why would Jesus tell the disciples, look at the two negatives. He warned them and he instructed them not to say it to anyone if that is the core of the core. You know why? Verse 23. Because if anyone wishes to come after me, first that person must deny himself. Then he must take up his cross daily. And then he must follow me. And the problem we have in the church today is that we have the right theology behind our pulpit. But those that preach it, more often than not, don't look like Jesus. They haven't denied themselves. They haven't taken up their cross. They are not following Jesus. And we think that right theology will do it. But right theology will not do it if the messenger doesn't look like Jesus. And if one word the Lord has for the church is don't preach anymore, please. Because look at the sequence. First, we deny ourselves. Most pastors have done that. Then we take up our cross. I would say the vast majority has done that. But what is still lacking after having denied ourselves and taken up our cross is to follow Jesus. Why? Because Jesus spends the bulk of his time not on church matters, but out there, in the Castro district in San Francisco, in the prostitute district downtown. He's looking for the lost sheep. Let this word penetrate. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus asked twice the question, what do you want me to do for you? The first time of the disciples. And what do they say? Lord, give us a throne. We would like a throne. One on the right, one on the left. Because you are such a wonderful guy that we want to be next to you. And a throne implies people will come to us with petitions. We'll make them known to you. You will grant them and we will give them to you then. And they will look good, right? 11 verses later, he asked the same question of a blind man by the name of uh, Bartimaeus. And he says, give me the eyesight. And the next verse says, and Bartimaeus followed him on the road. And folks, time and again, time and again, when we ask Jesus something, it has to do with something that will enhance our ministry, will cause our church to grow, will cause our cash flow to improve. We have to do with something that will benefit us, but we do not follow Jesus on the road. And it's so interesting that in Matthew 7, 21 to 27, 
where Jesus will tell some people his job description sounds like ministers. He said, but Lord, we cast out demons. Lord, we healed people. Lord, we did many things in your name. He will say to those, I never knew you. I never knew you. And then we have immediately the parable of the two foundations. You have built on a foundation that is not my foundation. You heard my words, but you didn't do them. So what we see here are apostles that like the ministry so that they can give a report of what they did. That they resent multitudes because multitudes take them away from their time with Jesus. Who would like to have a ministry next to Jesus to be validated by Jesus. But Jesus says, you should follow me. Then I think the Lord did what we do when we cannot get all our team members to get this right play. We take the leaders away. So he does that in verse 28. And he takes uh, Peter and John and James, and they go in the glory of God descends there on, the, on that mount. And when they see the glory of God, verse 32, they saw him in his glory. Peter comes to Jesus, the guy that was too lazy to feed 5,000 people with multiplied bread, and he says, Lord, I would like to volunteer to build not one but three tabernacles, none of them for us, all of them for you. Listen carefully, because it's good for us to be here. Do you get the impact? Why did he want to do something for Jesus? It was good for us. Let the Holy Spirit examine our souls now. How many things we do because it's good for us? How many engagements do we take because they make us look good? How many sermons do we preach because they allow somehow to put in on display some ability that we have? So at that very moment, the father gets very upset, very upset. And then in verse 34, the father has to pick up a cloud and wrap himself in a cloud, like when you and I, you know, kind of uh, the phone is ringing and we are in the shower and, and we just grab anything that comes handy to get to the phone. And the father has to cover himself with a cloud because if he would have come just there, a la natural, he would have fry them like eggs, you know, with his glory, because he said they didn't know what they were saying. And the father says, listen carefully, this is, verse 35, my son, my cho chosen one, listen to him. What is the implication? Don't talk to him, listen to him. Listen to him. Folks, I'm still understanding this. I don't claim that I arrive and I'm teaching them to you. But the more I search my soul, the more I find that when I'm with Jesus, I do most of the talking. I make most of the motions. I bring up most of the issues. I'm so blessed to have in Dick Anderson, the pastor of Sierra Madre Congregation and Church, the chairman for our board, that time and again, he says, drop everything. Listen to the Lord. Listening to God is a difficult thing. They were so much in offside that the father had to come and say, hey, guys, he is the chosen one, not you. Listen to him. Do you see the pattern here? Let's pause for a moment as we move on to the next session. Thank you.